All right, so we've now covered um, essentially what's been the first unit of the year, which is um, kinematics, but we've covered them with rotation. And now uh, we just talked about torque, and we said that torque is the rotational component of, or the rotational equivalent of force. So we've already talked about kinematics. So now the next little section here is going to be talking about the dynamics of uniform circular, or of uh, rotational motion. So we're going to have to break down a few things, but essentially what I want you to always keep in mind is that the angular acceleration is the net torque divided by the moment of inertia. Um, so this is what we're going to be getting into. This is the same thing as saying that A equals F net over the mass. Now, for the next two sections, we're going to be talking about that in terms of the rotational equivalent. Um, so if things get a little confusing, it's because we got to break these concepts down. We've already broken down torque. Uh, that was the last section. And now we got to break a little bit more down with uh, the moment of inertia. So this is a, a pre-lecture video. He talks about um, holding like a baseball bat and balancing it. But the concept is, is how the mass is distributed matters. It changes how something accelerates angularly or rotationally. Uh, he also has a little demo over here where he like spins it with uh, it out versus it in. And um, there's a, how the mass is distributed plays in to how something accelerates. So that's what we're going to break down in the next uh, two sections. So we're going to start that by talking about um, actually mainly focused on the center of gravity. Um, and because that'll get us into gravitational torque, which is how gravity pulls an object down. So here's here's the, the complex issue is that we have this we have this person here. She's on uh, she's on the uneven bars, right? So we got a bar here and a bar here. And She's rotating about that axis. She's rotating about the bar. Now, when I think about that, then, she's got a point right here that's experiencing some torque some distance away, and she's got a point over here that's experiencing some torque some other distance away. And really, she's got an infinite amount of particles in between those two points. And gravity is going to pull down every particle at some extent, and because it's pulling down every particle at some extent, they're all experiencing different torques because they're all different distance away from the rotational axis. Wow, that gets really confusing really quickly. So every single particle experiences a torque. So how would I calculate that? And the answer is we, we don't. Um, what we do instead is we take a look at the center of gravity. The center of gravity is you take all the points on the person's body and simplify it with one point at the center of mass, simplifies that calculation. So instead of calculating every point, we calculate one point at the center of gravity. And it is still some radius away. And um, instead of, of calculating the mass of every particle, it's just going to be her overall weight. It's mass times gravity. So that way we can calculate the torque. Um, by assuming that all the net forces of all the different weights equal this one weight right here at the center of gravity. So here's an example problem of this real quick. Um, and we will calculate it real quick. But um, there's a flagpole, right? And it's, it's posted on uh, the wall. And gravity pulls this entire pole, um, the entire pole, it pulls it down uh, towards the Earth. And if I want to calculate how much torque it's exerting on the wall, I would have to think about this point and this point and this point and this point. This big ball is pulling down, right? So instead, we simplify it. We say, OK, here's the center of mass. It's pulling down with its weight this distance away. So uh, in order to calculate the torque on the wall, it's just RF perpendicular. Or in this case, um, it's drawn so that we can use the perpendicular component of the radius. So R perpendicular F. So that's going to be the radius. Um, and that radius is from the wall to the center of mass, which is 1.6 meters. Uh, and then this will be times the cosine of R 25 degrees times our uh, weight, which is mass times gravity. So I have... Uh, a mass of 3.2 kilograms, and gravity is, of course, 10 meters per second squared. And I get a torque of about 45 newton meters.
And uh, that's how we'll simplify this calculations. This is not a particle. This is an entire object. But we simplify that object by looking at the center of mass. Um, another way to think about why things rotate is simply by thinking that weight acts straight down. So here, it's a really simple example, but if you were to pinch a ruler, and that ruler went at an angle, it has a perpendicular component of weight. The weight always acts straight down, right? So straight down towards the center of the Earth. But that means that if it's not straight up and down, there's a perpendicular component, and that perpendicular component is going to cause that angular acceleration. So there is a torque being exerted by gravity. So that, that will rotate then, to be straight up and down. So an object will naturally want to have its center of mass directly below the pivot point. Um, so that's just a natural thing because of gravity, and that's what's going to cause that gravitational torque. So here's a little quick check, and it, the question is, which point could be the center of gravity of this L-shaped piece? So the concept of the center of gravity is that um, all of the mass of the object can be held at this one point and it would be perfectly balanced. Now this one's a little misleading because the right answer is A. And A is not on the object, but it's where you were to would quote unquote, you know, average all the pieces out. So it doesn't actually physically have to be on the object. If I think about uh, the center of mass of a roll of tape, it's going to be in the middle uh, but there's nothing in the middle if it's like masking tape, right? So the center of mass doesn't have to be on the object. So now that we've talked about conceptually what the center of mass is, and in that example problem we gave it to you, um, now we talk, we're going to talk a little bit about how to calculate it. And um, if, if any object's um, balanced on either side, then it's just in the middle and it's really simple. Um, but if I, want, if I have two uneven masses, then the center of mass becomes um, a little bit, a little bit more tricky to calculate. So here I have, uh, I have a, a picture. I have a, a large mass and a small mass, and this picture is correct um, in that the pivot point is closer to the large mass. And my question is, why is the pivot point closer to the large mass? And the answer lies within torque. So the pivot point is supposed to be where uh, the net torque is going to be zero. So tau net is zero. So there's an object on the right, and it's pulling down with some torque going clockwise. And then there's an object on the left, and it's pulling down with some torque going counterclockwise. And those two torques need to add up to equal zero. So tau net has to equal zero. There is no net torque. And that is where the object is balanced. And therefore, um, we can calculate the center of gravity. So let's take a look at that mathematically. So there's a torque on the object on the left, and that's going in the positive direction. And there's a torque on the object on the right, and that's going in the negative direction, right, because it's going clockwise. And so each one of them have some weight that's acting, and then each one of them have some distance from the center of gravity that they are acting. The first one, it's the center of gravity minus whatever this distance is. And for the second one, it's the center of gravity minus whatever, or the, I'm sorry, it's this distance minus whatever the center of gravity is. And by setting um, one of these numbers in the future, we'll set equal to zero to make this simpler. Um, but by, by setting up these torques canceling out, we can come up with our formula that the center of gravity is just the sum of the masses t times their physical location divided by the sum of the masses. And in, in future problems, and you'll do this in your problems packet, um, we'll just we'll put x1 equal to 0, and then that actually cancels out this mass, but it doesn't cancel it out on the bottom. That'll just help us set up the number line. So we can calculate the center of gravity, and I'll, I'll, I'll get rid of this. Uh, well, we can calculate the center of gravity by using this formula, and this formula just says where in the x-plane 
our center of gravity is. Now, we could make this a little bit more complex, and if we had a mass that was also like coming off to the side up here, we could calculate the x center of gravity, and we could calculate the y center of gravity by using the same equation, and uh, except replacing all the x's with y's. Um, and um, we could calculate it in two dimensions where that center of gravity is. Uh, so here's a, um, a quick little um, summary then. So because the center of gravity only depends on the distance away from the pivot point, uh, or it is a pivot point, but the distance and the mass from the pivot point, objects that are larger count more heavily in terms of torque, so the center of gravity has to be closer to larger objects than to heavier objects. And uh, for people, this tends to be uh, their stomach. That's roughly where all your torques cancel up, but everyone is a little bit different. So here's a quick little uh, mathematical conceptual example. I have a 10 kilogram mass and a five kilogram mass attached with a quote unquote massless dumbbell. And uh, we're trying to calculate where the center of gravity is. So we just use our formula here. We, uh, we set the one on the left equal to uh, at the zero point. So that actually goes away in our calculation, but it stays on the bottom. And I get 0.33 meters. And if I think about that, that means this right here is 0.33 meters. And this right here is 0.67 meters. And that makes sense because torque is force times distance. So this one has twice the mass. So it's got twice the force, so it has half the distance in order for the torques to cancel up. Uh, we can check this out with a hammer. So this is a, a quick little demonstration. Uh, where should I put the hammer on my finger to be able to balance it? It's going to be pretty close um, to the head of the hammer, maybe somewhere around there. And there's a center of mass here with some radius away, and there's a center of mass Oh, it's, you can't really see it. Let me try changing colors. There's center mass right here that's some radius away, and those two torques are going to cancel. Now, granted, this whole thing has mass, but we're taking center of masses of each part in order to calculate where the pivot point is. And that's your quick little introduction to center of mass. And the reason, again, that we're talking about this is that angular acceleration is torque net divided by the moment of inertia. Um, by understanding the center of mass, we're going to get a little bit more into the moment of inertia. Actually, we're going to get into the moment of inertia in the next section. And being able to calculate the center of mass technically will help us out with that. Um, of course, that's going to get us into a discussion about algebra-based versus calc-based, and we're obviously going to stick with algebra-based physics, so this will actually be a little easier uh, than we think, but uh, we'll talk about that in the next section.